Welcome to week 9. Physical Sciences Assessment. Let's get cracking. Now this week we are going to provide you with a model for um, looking at your uh, units of study in assessment task number 2. And the key things that I want to point out here is that you know, I'm going to give you a list of questions, uh, a few little heuristics and models that you can use to explore your unit of science that may help you identify areas where you could ra make recommendations for improvements and development or even to make more explicit the assessment uh, tasks in your particular unit of study. Remember we need two formative and two summative so again the, re the reason I'm providing you with these lists of questions is to encourage you to think broadly about formative and summative assessment. So we begin by talking about science as, as a well-planned opportunity for, for engaging learning opportunities and hence that's the whole nature of inquiry-based learning. We know it's got three steps. We do the introduction, okay, we, we, we do this, establish the student understandings, what we call the baseline assessment or diagnostic assessment occurs there. We then do part two, which is the student activity or the learning activity, where of course we get into the formative assessment, you know, with a, a meddler in the middle and Vygotsky's little zone of proximal development. And the third thing we do, of course, is the classroom discussion where we use our questioning skills, the third step, to bring it all together. So part of the proce planning process for teaching any, any unit of study obviously inquires decisions regarding the, the types of strategies that can best develop student understanding. And here is where assessment task two sits. So this topic explores formative and summative assessment in line with uh, assessment task two. And it looks primarily at the physical sciences context um, and again, what I'll do is give you a couple of tools, rubrics, heuristics to help you explore your own topics of choice for assessment task number two. Um, one of the useful people we're going to introduce you to this week is Dr. John Biggs. He's a Tasmanian-born educator and a founder of the, the Constructive Alignment Movement and School of Thought. Um, he published in the 1990s and, and 2000s. Um, and he talks about, you know, constructively aligning that in, in a very Vygotskian sense assessment, learning and teaching um, to maximise student learning outcomes. And he begins, of course, with learning outcomes as the planning uh, at the start, the, the first link in, in the learning chain. And of course, the last thing uh, um, Big suggests we actually organise is assessment. Yeah, that's the last thing we actually plan and design. So he comes up with his solo taxonomy, 1998, and it's particularly relevant to assessment task number two because it gives you a model and a strategy to analyse the efficacy of both formative and summative assessment within a unit of study. Basically what it says is teaching, learning and assessment aligned. If they're not, it's going to lead to misconceptions, misunderstandings and a breakdown in trust and performance. Let's get on. Learning outcomes. John Bain, a Griffith University educator, would argue that learning outcomes drive the structure of both teaching and assessment. This, of course, doesn't come from Bain, but comes from Biggs. It was his founding principle. Biggs talks about constructive alignment and beginning from the learning outcomes. We can state the learning outcomes and we can line up our learning events and also our assessment and so that they're consistent and they, they feed into one another. Then it's going to reduce the student's opportunity to go on a, a merry chase and learn what they want to learn or be strategically negligent and not learn what the teacher wants them to learn, um, but to actually encourage them to the learning is almost enforced, okay, so it's almost enforced, it's almost mandated because the task and the learning outcome and the assessment are intertwined, totally intertwined. So by the end of the topic, we're going to look at some ex specific examples of formative assessment strategies that can be used effectively in the science classroom, um, particularly with circuits and shadows, and I'll pick this up in the, uh, the activities um, session on Wednesday in the interactive. To make sure you get access to some examples of informative assessment, I've actually put in the Moodle this week. You'll see there's quite a series, quite a series of formative assessment learning strategies. Everything from traffic lights right through to you know, little models that students can build for their own assessment feedback. Um, a whole range of strategies there. And, and again, as many early childhood ones as there are primary school ones to give you some range um, that to choose from. Um, but Black and William point to the, the formative assessment as the oil in the learning chain. As a matter of fact, their own research in 98 and research from the OECD in 2005 point out that formative assessment provides the most achievement gains. It's the stage of learning that provides the most achievement gains for all learners and particularly for poor learners. The second outcome here 
explain ways in which students' scientific understanding can be effectively enhanced in the science classroom using effective strategies. And of course, that is a logical and, and um, you know, honourable outcome. The key terms for this week, I'm going to turn to the work of William Batters. Um, Batters is an elementary school teacher and an academic also in uh, the US, and he's published uh, a range of material around assessment. But I, I particularly want to use him because I like his definition. And he refers to assessment as a sample taken from a larger domain of content and process skills. So it's a sample, it's one of many behaviours that allows one, that is the assessor, to infer student understanding of a part of the larger domain being explored. Now, this sample may include behaviours, products, knowledge and performances. And as long as it's a continuous and ongoing process, it has the chance to be more robust, more authentic and, of course, and more reliable. We also raised the notion of exploratory discussions this week. Talking in a group to interthink. And, of course, we also know about groupthink. Um, group think is a term used to apply to uh, a group as it processes words, knowledge, material, um, and it only ever processes it to the the, you know, the upper level of the group. It never goes beyond. So um, we're going to look at this notion of interthink and describe compounds out loud. It involves examining and observing children's behaviours, listening to their ideas, developing questions to promote conceptual understanding, and you can see it's very consistent with Bader's notion here. Okay. Assessment strategies, ways of determining students' learning, including talk, observations, role, model, dance, drawing and art. Um, I also run professional development with some large organisations, um, including the Commonwealth Bank, um, including the Queensland Police Force. And in there, or believe it or not, we've used role play models, dance, drawing and art. Um, also, so adults are equally as uh, um, effective, it's e equally effect effective strategies to enable people to get in touch um, with their understandings. Another term that comes up this week is authentic learning. And here we're going to focus on real world situations and significant tasks that are relevant to the student's life inside and outside the classroom. And that's the key point there, that have relevancy to the student's life. You know, Piaget's notion coming to the fore here. You know, the child is a scientist in their own life. Authentic learning is about imbuing the child with that natural curiosity. I'm going to begin talking about some common ground. We all know about constructivism, or we think we do. But within that framework we loosely call constructivism, there are a range of different schools. Um, my leanings in particular are towards the socio-cultural constructivists. Um, and I think we can firmly put Vygotsky in that, that field. And But you know we're talking here about constructivism in general, so we don't want to break it down to the micro-groups and tribes of constructivism. We're going to talk about constructivist principles. And these principles basically s suggest that learners' preconceptions and ideas about science are critical in shaping their new understandings. Okay? So their preconceptions and ideas are critical in shaping new understanding. Hence the notion of constructivism. So learning occurs in interaction between the individual and the social environment, says Vygotsky. Now, his seminal work, of course, was entitled Mind and Society, so it gives you a fairly strong hint of where he comes from. The individual is constantly interacting with their social environment. Thinking is conducted through actions that alter a situation, and the situation can change the thinking. The two are constantly interacting. So assessment in this, this pool we call constructivist theory must address three critical issues. And here we see this reflected in the Australian curriculum must address students' prior knowledge and, in the science area, hopefully working on their misconceptions. It must take into account student learning styles and the multiple abilities, hence the collaborative focus of much of the, the Australian curriculum. And it also must teach for a depth of understanding rather than just a breadth of coverage. And if you have a look at this, and particularly in the units you're using for assessment task number two, some of them are quite significant units. Okay, some of them will go easily for a term and most comfortably for half a term. So it's about going deeper, not further. Meaningful assessment involves examining the learner's entire conceptual network, not just focusing on discrete facts and principles. So meaningful assessment brings into that c focus the community f um, um, skills. And we can look at those, for instance, um, you know, the endeavour skills with that when children are working together in collaborative learning. So meaningful assessment must target the skill component 
um, the communications component as much as the knowledge component. And the valued outcomes of science, learning and teaching are placing greater emphasis on the child's ability to inquire, to reason scientifically, to apply science concepts to real world situations and to communicate effectively what the child knows about science. Okay, Very Piaget in you know, making the child a scientist in their own life and in their own world. Common ground number two. And the reason I'm stating this is because I don't need you to restate it in your assessment task back to me. Okay, We are beginning from this common point. This is all common knowledge, public knowledge, for this assessment task. So effective assessment has got five principles. It's got to have purpose and impact. So how will the assessment be used and how will it impact instruction and the selection of curriculum? So already you can start to see that we are beginning to have some insight into pulling apart the units of study that we've chosen. Purpose and impact. What is the purpose and impact of assessment in that unit you have chosen? How will it be used and how will it impact the instruction and the selection of curriculum? Impact the instruction. So what will the teacher be doing? A strong part of assessment task two. Validity and fairness is another part of effective assessment. Does it measure what it intends to measure? Does it allow students to demonstrate both what they know and are able to do? And look at your units through the lens of validity and fairness. Is the unit achieving these? Is the assessment in this unit achieving validity and fairness outcomes? Reliability. Is the data that is collected reliable across applications within the classroom, school and district? Okay, really interesting to know. Is the data reliable? Significance. Does it address content and skills that are valued by reflect and, and reflect current thinking in the field? So is the, you know, the assessment and, and, and the, the measures and the data you're collecting, is it significant? Is it significant in the fact that it's actually applied and relevant? Current thinking in the field. Something you need to address in assessment task number two. If you look at the criteria, you'll clearly see that you are required to use um, a range of sources and those sources must be relevant and appropriate. Efficiency, the fifth point. Uh, effective assessment is efficient and we can't over invest in assessment methods at the, at the expense of teaching and learning time. And this is you know, a, an issue to be addressed when we look at, at some of our, our, our units of study. Um, the amount of time that goes into assessment um, and some of you experience this in your classrooms when you go on practicum um, you know, th the teacher is running around the class um, like a headless uh, chicken, um, free-ranging around all these student assessment tasks which they've got to report and provide data and evidence for. Um, assessment needs to be effective and efficient. And efficiency is, is one of the sub-clauses of that effective um, equation. Common ground number three. What are the science knowledges we actually test? Now, by this stage of the course, we are not testing science fact, science you know, re regurgitations. We are not testing you know, people's awareness of scientific theories. We are testing science knowledges. We are assessing for science knowledges. And these can be broken down into eight different categories. Now, we've probably not gone through and numbered them like this before, but in your unit, it will be broken down this way. You will see that there are declarative knowledge statements. There are things, concepts, facts, the students are going to need to know, bodies of knowledge. There's conditional knowledge, what we describe as the why knowledge. So once we know the what, we have to know the why. And we can see that this underpins the, the, the inquiry process. The procedural knowledge, the how knowledge. Now we're starting to have a look at some of the science inquiry skills, which were so poorly neglected in assessment task number one. Very few students actually even put science inquiry skills on their page let alone used it as a, a rationale for exploring um, assessment in that first task. Um, application knowledge. The use of knowledge in both similar settings and in different contexts. You can see here this is actually a knowledge. It sits at the top of Bloom's hierarchy. It sits in the fifth E of the five E's model by Brivey. Application knowledge is an outcome. The use of knowledge in both similar settings and in different contexts. Problem solving is a knowledge. We have science investigations. We talk about solving investigation issues, problems, um, with an outcome. 
an investigative outcome through an investigative process, which involves critical thinking, is also a knowledge that we teach to question the falsifiability. You quote, you know, when we talk about Karl Popper, you know, the whole notion was we falsify, we falsify, and we falsify until the point where we can't falsify. Then it's a proven theory. Documentation, a process of communicating understanding. Now, this is something really that we have to look at. You know, when we're teaching these knowledges, is the assessment we're doing, is the assessment we're conducting allowing students to communicate their understanding? And that's a really good point. You may be able to find a few recommendations in this area. And finally, th science understandings. Synthesis by the learner of concepts, processes and skills. And quite well declared and quite, quite well um, described in the Australian Curriculum for Science. Assessment types. Now, we've talked about this several times. You know, the fourth area of common ground going into assessment task number two is that there exist three basic assessment types and that we have a common language for those. The baseline assessments we call diagnostic. Okay, that's been interchangeable, that term. They're really baseline measures. It's what a teacher does to understand and ascertain prior knowledge of students. That is their entry level knowledge. And as we know from our survey in task number one, it's oral and written responses based on individual experience. We've got paper and pencil tests, multiple choice, short answer, essay, constructive response, written reports. All of these are formative. Of course, multiple choice can also be done summatively and has been to its, uh, its uh, maligned reputation um, in, in sciences for many, many years, where it's about science, it's about learning facts. But in actually, multiple choice is a very good formative tool. And the aim here is to assess students' acquisition of knowledge and concepts as it's building. Embedded assessments, assessing an aspect of student learning in the context of learning uh, the experience, uh, of the learning experience. Again, formative oral reports require communication by the student to demonstrate scientific understanding. Interviews, assess individual and group performance before, during and after a science experience. Performance tasks, require students to create or take an action related to a problem, issue or scientific concept. Again, this goes up in scale and can also be a summative task. And you can see performance tasks usually appear in stages four and five as applied to new knowledge within the five E's model. Checklists, monitor and record anecdotal information, okay, it can be notebooking, formative and summative, investigative projects, Requires students to explore a problem or concern stated either by the teacher or the students. Again, summative. And we go on. Extended or unit projects require the application of knowledge or skills in an open-ended setting. Summative. And we see it moving very much into the open knowledge areas there. Portfolios, one of my favourite. And people think portfolios are actually quite time intense and um, a heavy um, mode of assessment. Um, but having used portfolio assessment myself, even in university courses, um, I actually find it to be quite um, um, time efficient um, because you're having the ongoing dialogue. It's continuous. You have a range of, of methods of assessing the students. You're getting a 360 degree review of this student's work um, and you can actually do it. You can pr s uh, scale it out over an entire term and unit and at the end you can sit down and you can have a real feedback session with the learner as well. So you've got longitudinal evidence, plenty of data, plenty of comments for your, your reporting and your feedback, and of course, face-to-face -face opportunities on a regular basis in that chain of connection. So again, common ground number four, our assessment types. In your units of study, you are going to see all of these aspects down on the left-hand side of the screen. They will appear in various components of the course. Here is their purpose. We know it. Okay, and here is their focus. We also are able to discern that. Don't spend too much time in your assignments talking about these items. Summarise them, put together an understanding for the unit of the as assessment regime within that unit. Once you've done that, move on. Because as we said in last week's lecture, the high fruit is where most of the marks are in this particular assignment. We're coming now to John Biggs and his notion of constructive alignment. Now, Biggs has uh, a taxonomy that he calls, for want of a better name, the solo taxonomy. And up in the right-hand corner, you can see that it actually stands for the structure of observed learning outcome. 
And it's an interesting model because it's, it's just a means of classifying learning in terms of their complexity. So it enables assessment students work in terms of its quality and not how many bits of this and how many bits of that it's got. And I'll talk about the model. Figs would argue that we start up here in the left hand corner, that we, we consider first of all what the outcomes of our particular learning unit are. And we formulate these and from these the assessment criteria finally get developed. The assessment criteria or the assessment regime, once an appropriate assessment regime has been designed, activities are then organised within that regime that will help teach the material, the critical material, to the students. So in meeting the assessment criteria, the learner is in fact going through a series of learning tasks, each of which can be explicitly linked and connected to that criteria. The final thing that actually comes up with is the teaching and learning activities. What the teacher does and what the students do are aimed at achieving the outcomes by meeting the assessment criteria. This takes advantage of no, known tendency of students to learn what they think will be assessed, and Biggs calls this backwash in his, his 2003 paper. Um, he doesn't say backwash is a bad thing, he says backwash is a great teaching opportunity. Um, Vygotsky called backwash, for instance, the zone of proximal development. You jump in the backwash, you surf the backwash, and once you're in the backwash, you can then start to connect, make those, those you know, Vygotsky and those constructivist connections um, between students' learning, uh, the gaps in their learning, and the knowledge uh, points or, or the knowledge hooks they need to grab onto. So essentially here's his model, that we begin with the learning outcomes. Once we've got our learning outcomes, we then design an, an assessment item to match each of those outcomes. Once we've got that, okay, we're then able to begin to build our teaching and learning events or activities. And this is Biggs's model. And the reason we're looking at Biggs is so that we can work backwards from here when we look at our units. Now Biggs would argue that there are a range of outcomes here. A, a learner can come out of the unit and they may have only picked up one or a few aspects of the task, the learning task. He calls this unistructural. There's a strong body of knowledge, a strong result. Um, unfortunately, um, it's not an elaborated result, so it's, it's a low level result but it's got one common theme running through it, or a few common aspects running through it um, that basically constitute the learner's understanding. We then have several aspects, but they're unrelated, and Biggs calls this multi-structural. So a learner can come out of a unit of study uh, with several con concepts under their belt, but have no relationship between those const constructs and concepts. And Biggs calls this state of mind, or this state of learning, as multi-structural. Then we do, we learn how to integrate them into a whole. There are learners who will complete a unit of study, go through each of the assessment steps and integrate them or, or turn them into a relational whole that helps summarise their understanding of the unit or of the concept under question. For instance, whether it's forces, you're teaching forces or magnetism, okay? At the end of the unit, the learner has integrated each of the individual tasks, assessment tasks, to form a relational understanding of that theme. And when we finally teach a unit well, um, we get the synergy of that, that great thwack of understanding, um, learners are able to actually extend and apply their understandings to untaught applications. So it's the fifth E we're talking about here, it's the elaborations and the evaluations, the fourth and fifth E's, that the learner is going out there in an extended abstract world and applying their understandings. So Big says this all begins from our learning outcomes. Once we have that, we design an assessment regime. Once we have that, we explore our teaching and learning activities. This actually sounds like assessment task number two, doesn't it? Each of your units has stated learning outcomes first part of your task is to define the assessment regime in that unit and the second part of that task is to look at how that regime is supported through the teaching and learning activities and by the role of the teacher. Your task is then to make four recommendations for each unit based on that, based on what you find. A little more on Biggs. Hopefully by now you're starting to realise that he's got a bit to offer, or you're sharing my opinion that he in fact does. Now in the centre of the column, 
Big starts off with his curriculum outcomes. And we can see here that he's got his own standards, the very best understanding he calls an A, highly satisfactory is the B level, quite unsatisfactory is the C level, D is just a pass, and of course the one level I haven't put in here is the level that Biggs calls incompetent, okay? where there's no, no framework from the learner, no, no understanding. Now this little diagram is, is just a little heuristic again, saying the assessment task and the teaching learning activities feed into these curriculum outcomes. The curriculum outcomes are the core. So when you're looking at your unit, identify your curriculum outcomes. Then have a look at the assessment tasks. Log the assessment tasks. And usually, some of the key areas to look for okay, is the differentiation within your marking criteria. How well do the assessment tasks differentiate learners' levels? Is it a formative assessment? Then it really needs to differentiate, doesn't it? If it's summative, it also allows you know, the scope for differentiation too so that we can then actually grade and feed back. Down here we can also see the use of verbs. Again, language is central to reality. Once we, you know, we construct our reality through understanding and our access to language. So if we are using verbs, and again, Bloom's taxonomy you know, began this process. The, the revised Bloom's in 2001 um, extended it. And you f when we look at the solo, um, Biggs's model, he too bases his setting of, of curriculum outcomes on the appropriate use of action or transitive verbs. And the learning and teaching activities, okay, as you can see, they must feed into the curriculum outcomes too. And Biggs you know, identifies they can be teacher, peer or self-controlled. And that opens the scope in any science unit, particularly in primary connections, where we see the teacher is playing you know, a supportive role, the meddler in the middle. Peer controlled, where we see students constantly engaged in collaborative learning and self-controlled, of course, where there's a high degree uh, of use of ICTs and, and uh, online interactions. A couple of quotes from Biggs to give you an idea of what he's talking about. Biggs says that we need to design this way. We, curriculum units need to be explicit, that assessment needs to be linked to outcomes. And that way, if they are, students will stop the trend of what he calls backwash. That is, students learn what they think they will be tested on. He calls it backwash. And when the assessment determines what and how students learn more than the curriculum does. And I think most of us sitting in our chairs at the moment would agree with Biggs. Biggs notes that if the assessment regime does not properly reflect curriculum objectives, then what we finish up with is just surface learning. Interesting note, isn't it? Isn't that one of the big critiques that Dennis Goodrum had of the science curriculum in Australia prior to 2012? That it, it, it basically reinforced and supported models of surface learning. Now, that's quite catastrophic. If we have a look, really, since 2006, 2007, there's been a dramatic decline in the number of senior high school students pursuing sciences. This has trickled on to university and has now trickled into in industry. So much so that Australia has a science or a STEM skill shortage. And this is something we're trying to address in the education system. This is why we've come up with inquiry-based learning, and we can link it to next week's topic when we talk about engagement, because uh, inquiry-based learning is meant to be much more engaging for learners, and meant to be much more motivational. And yet, I even here we are, 2017, five years since the release of the Australian curriculum, and less than you know, all high schools, less than 50% of all high schools in Australia have actually effectively switched to an inquiry-based model. So they are teaching the Australian curriculum, which is designed around inquiry principles, in the old chalk and talk methods. Despite the statistics, despite the, the social and political imperative to get science back in the classroom and on its feet, we are seeing less and less students engaging with science. Big's gone to say, students that always second-guess the assessment task and then learn what they think they'll meet need to meet those requirements. But, as we know, if those assessment requirements can mirror the curriculum, we, there's no problem. Students will be learning what they're supposed to be learning. So we are actually assessing our curriculum. We're getting them with both barrels. It's a shotgun approach. And this is the principle of Biggs's model. So when you're looking at assessment task number two, apply the shotgun. Okay? Does our assessment mirror the curriculum? Bloom. It's really important to come back to Bloom. And again, here, just to show the, uh, I think, the relevance of Big's um, solo taxonomy, um, I've matched him up against Bloom for you. 
um, and the revised version of Bloom at that level too. So as you can see going down Bloom's taxonomy, on the left hand side of the page we can see the six stages there. Synthesis, creation, evaluation, analysis, application, comprehension and knowledge. Going from higher order to lower order in this case. And we can see on the right hand side of the page we've got Biggs and Collis's solo taxonomy. And again it also goes down in, in descending order. And he begins from extended abstract thinking. And some of the verbs that Biggs and Collis use here, theorise, generate, generalise, create, reflect, you can see very much reflected here in Bloom's taxonomy. Now, Biggs and Collis have only the five stages, um, whereas I've actually broken Bloom's taxonomy into um, the six stages. And you can see in the, ver the verb structures here for each of those stages. Now, this is just based on a meta-analysis of the words that come up most in most assessment uh, and learning objectives at each stage. Of, of Bloom's taxonomy so and it's it's not exclusive there are more that go fit in those categories but these are just the most common ones and we can see what's happened with um, Big's second stage of relational thinking and Bloom's taxonomy calls this analysis and application Bloom says what we're doing here is uh, Big says what we're doing here is actually building our relational frameworks comprehension the comprehension phase Bloom calls this multi-structural thinking where we're doing our arranging our mental arranging, our, our cognitive arrangements are starting to, to come together like little bunches of flowers in vases all around you know, the neurons in our head. Um, we are putting together these multi-structural strands. And down here of course we've just got a knowledge phase um, at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, which I don't say just the knowledge phase. Knowledge phase is critical. Okay, whereas a lot of learners already know how to determine what the key knowledge is, define, list, name, recall, record, it's obviously an entry level. If you're doing it at levels of attainment, if that's all you're able to do, um, then Biggs would call this just a pass. Just one relevant aspect. If you, you can only recall the knowledge, but you can't comprehend and link it together, you can't analyse and apply using that knowledge, you can't evaluate other criteria or other, other phenomena using that knowledge, and you're unable to synthesise or create using that knowledge, um, then you are, as, as Biggs would say here, you're only utilising one relevant aspect. So the reason why I'm applying this to, to Biggs and Collis's solo taxonomy, um, you may be comfortable just using Bloom. Fantastic. You may want to use Biggs and Collis's solo taxonomy, which is quite similar, but again, helps us look, for instance, when we, it links it very much to the learning objectives and to the learning outcomes. Okay, and we can actually go through this process of connecting, naming, explaining, labelling and designing really effective learning outcomes and from there working on our assessment tasks and our review of those assessment tasks. So what are the links to assessment task number two? And really it's all about the base or the basis of what we're doing. At a more cons uh, complex level, constructive alignment requires a balance and synergy between all aspects between a whole school approach and if you like in a curriculum like the science curriculum between a national approach where we're looking at a range of schools in a range of states in a range of uh, social areas in a range of classifications and a range of systems coming together you know, we need a, a curriculum that's going to constructively align the learners within quite a, a diverse system and the place we start of course is the professional standards we've got the goals of teachers the wants and needs of students. We're using an inquiry model. The curriculum is broad based and authentic. The teaching methods used, of course, reflect the inquiry model. Assessment procedures and the method to report results, again, have to be constructively aligned. Psychological and social climate of the classroom is really important, what we call the learning milieu. Okay, really important. We need to align that with our curriculum, with our teaching methods, with the wants and needs of students and with our own professional goals. There has to be a constructive alignment between each of these things. Okay, have a look at your unit of study. What areas of that unit of study are going to challenge this notion of constructive alignment? And of course we're also going to need to align the psychological and social climate of the school. Okay, And what we're talking about here is a whole school approach. They need to work towards the common goals 
of constructive alignment where we're getting a balance and a synergy between each aspect of the school and the learning environment. Imbalance in the system can lead to poor teaching and surface learning. Non-alignment can be signified by inconsistencies, unmet expectations and practices that enable us or, or, or point to us as, as being contradictory to what we actually preach. So constructive alignment is a powerful metaphor. And again, it's all about beginning from those learning uh, outcomes, mapping that onto learning tasks and activities, and then building assessment that is going to develop those learning outcomes uh, related to those learning tasks. Assessment task number two. What are some of the inconsistencies that we might find in our units of study? Some of the unmet expectations and some of the contradictions that live there. For a start, we may be suffering from a, 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 a verb leakage. Um, we may be using verbs that don't actually tell the student or teacher how they would know if a learning objective was met. In other words, um, we're working without a standard of performance. So it's, you know, when you look at your units, have a look at how they're describing the learning outcomes. Have a look at the use of verb that's being chosen. Now, if you see ones like appreciate, become aware of, familiarise, know, learn about, well, they don't actually ever tell us how and when that standard's been met. So they're really, really not, not very good descriptors at all of what a good learning outcome can achieve. A second question to ask yourself, are all four steps in the alignment process evident? Does assessment in your unit one Describe the intended outcomes as standard using appropriate verbs, the point above. Two, does it create a learning environment likely to deliver these outcomes, our structural alignment that we were talking about on the last slide? Three, does the assessment enable you to judge if and how well students' performances meet the outcomes? And four, develop grading criteria, rubrics. Does the assessment provide grading criteria for judging the quality of student performance? And can that be used by the students to develop and judge their own quality of performance for self-assessment and the quality of others for peer assessment? So are those four steps in alignment obvious? If not, then you've got, you've got license, you've got warrant here to make some recommendations about how they could be. Some other questions to ask yourself when you're looking at unit of studies. Do the assessment approaches emphasize understanding rather than memoration and assess for understanding rather than surface knowledge or recall of facts? If so, how so? What teaching strategies are explicitly linked to this? And what assessment captures and measures at it? Question number four. People develop deep knowledge organised around important conceptual frameworks. Do the assessment approaches in your unit assess students' ability to assimilate new concepts and new conceptual frameworks, apply knowledge and solve problems? This is a really core focus of the, the Australian curriculum and the 5E's model. Think about it, stages four and five. Here we are now extending the students' knowledge into new elaborations using new, new investigations, science, scientific skills, inquiry skills. And the fifth stage, the fifth E, evaluation, where they're applying a scientific concept, basically doing what Popper would have done in, in the falsification model, basically applying a new concept and testing it and retesting it and retesting it in, in new situations. So does your, your unit of study do that? If so, how well? To what degree? Where does it do it? And how could it do it better? Number five, a fifth question to ask yourself. Does the assessment regime establish students' prior knowledge and monitor students' changing conceptions as teaching and learning proceeds? So is there evidence there of diagnostic assessment? And is there evidence there of ongoing formative assessment that actually targets changing conceptions? Now, go back to point four here. Deep knowledge is organised around important conceptual frameworks. So when these start to shift, when students start to learn, when neurons begin to fire, is their assessment built around capturing, reinforcing and feeding back on that? The sixth point. Do assessment approaches employ and also assess collaborative learning skills? 
Now bear in mind, if you're doing primary connections units, every single unit in primary connections is collaboratively based in teams or paired pair, pair learning models. So does the assessment touch on that? And what about communication? Does the assessment touch on modes of communication? Is it allowing students to develop a repertoire of communication skills within a scientific language and connect that directly to scientific literacy? Is the literacy formation taking place? Is the collaborative learning skills developing? Does assessment support both of those aspects? The seventh point, does the unit of work provide sensitive constructive feedback opportunities to students and use assessment practices that encourage self-assessment and metacognition? So here we are, we're going up to the, f the summative stage and you know, summative and formative often teachers, you, for instance, complain that you know, the summative assessment stops the students from learning. You know, it disrupts the formative learning cycle. Um, again, this is constructive alignment. Biggs would be quite critical of that because formative and summative assessment should be constructively aligned. They should be feeding into each other. They should be seamless. Okay, and that's what this point is actually asking. Does the unit of work provide sensitive and constructive feedback opportunities and does it use assessment practices that encourage self-assessment and metacognition? So in order to be sensitive, constructive in your feedback, you need to be working at that level where students are also thinking about their own learning processes. They're developing a language for learning, a metacognition, learning about learning. Is that evident in your unit? If not, could you make a recommendation to adapt or modify that unit using a particular approach. Visually, Seegers and uh, et al. 2003 painted it a little bit like this as a grid. And down on the left hand side of the grid, they've leveled what they call their six components of an effective uh, assessment regime. It's got to be auth authentic. It's got to have a number of measures. It, it must and, and levels of comprehension. It must have a, a range of levels of comprehension so that you can actually rate and feed back on, on learning performance. There must be dimensions of intelligence evident relating to, to learning processes and responsibility. Now what Seegers and, and, and his research team did was they actually looked at education as it used to be in this middle column here. Education as it used to be versus education as it is emerging and developing at this end of, of the, the diagram. And we can see that authenticity, okay, it used to be atomized. Learning was largely decontextualized. It was in a textbook. Now we're moving along that continuum. Contextualized and we're using skills in context as well. We're actually becoming scientists in our own inquiry processes. We're building all of these repertoires of practice quite effectively. Once upon a time, assessment was based on a single measure. Okay, now assessment, good assessment, effective assessment, is it needs to be based on a range of multiple measures, on multiple data sets. Levels of comprehension used to be low. Okay, where the variation in the levels of comprehension used to be low. Now we're looking at high discrimination in the levels of comprehension. Now we're trying to differentiate the learning outcomes. We're doing much more diagnostics, okay, rather than simply teaching a concept for rote learning and memory. The dimensions of intelligence used to be few and far between. Okay, we basically used to measure rote, rote recall. Now we're looking at spatial intelligence. We're looking at cultural intelligences. We're looking at a whole range of different intelligences, kinesthetic. We're, you know, we're using a range of different intelligences, intelligences in our assessment tasks to get, create a richer data set that we can actually report on and that might be meaningful in shaping the scholastic identity of the learner. And we look at the relation to the learning process. Isolation isolated assessment used to be the norm. You know, when I went to school, for instance, we had midterm tests, end of term tests, midterm tests, end of term tests. And of course, that they were kind of connected to the, to the education, they were kind of connected to the learning, but really what they were was is like scooping cream off the top of a, 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 car, a, a, a can of milk. What it was doing was just taking one snapshot at one point in time. These days, of course, we're talking more about integrated assessment, where we're looking at the learner 360 days uh, of the year, 360 degrees of performance. 
we're looking at a range of intelligences, many, many intelligence dimensions. We're looking at different comprehensions. We're using a range of measures to, to base our judgments and form our understandings. And ultimately, the responsibility for assessment you squarely lie with the teacher. Have a look at some of the, um, the peer-based models now, some of the inclusive student models that we have for assessment. Now, Segers provides you with a really rich heuristic here. See if you can apply it to your own units of study to de develop any, uh, an identify any potential gaps that may exist there. Um, is there an issue with authenticity? Um, is the assessment too repetitive? Is there too few assessment opportunities? The level of comprehension, is it explicitly stated? Dimensions of intelligence, how many intelligence are actually apparent in that unit of study? Is the assessment broad? Should it be broad or is it a specific unit looking at certain skills? Relation to the learning process, is, is assessment isolated or is it totally integrated? Responsibility. Who's doing most of the assessment, the teacher or the student? And herein lies an opportunity to make a really good recommendation, okay, if you want to shift some of that responsibility from the teacher to the student. There are ways of doing that, making the classroom more democratic. When looking at assessment in a unit of physical science, ask yourself questions. Ask yourself a range of questions, because when you look at your unit, it's these questions that will help you identify where you're going to make the recommendations. Is its primary purpose to improve student performance? Yes, fantastic, give it a tick. Is the assessment based on an understanding of how students learn? If it is, give it a tick. If not, make a recommendation. Is it to be an integral component of course design and not something to add on afterwards? If it is integral, and it is connected to learning outcomes and, as Biggs would say it, constructively aligned, fabulous. If it's not, make a recommendation about how it could be done better. Does it provide useful information to report credibly to parents and student on student achievement? What exact information does that, that assessment produce? And is that information credible? Will it report on actual achievement? And is it something that students and their parents would be really interested in. Question number five, does it have clarity of purpose, goals, standards and criteria? I mean, do they know what they're being assessed on? Why they're being assessed? Do they have knowledge, prior knowledge, of what they have to do to attain high levels of achievement? Question number six, does it employ a variety of measures? Does that unit allow for assessment that's going to produce a range of measures? Are its methods valid, reliable, and consistent? Point number eight. Does it pay attention to the outcomes and inquiry processes? Sorry for that typo there, I didn't notice that. Does it pay attention to attention to outcomes and inquiry processes? Big point, terribly put. Is the assessment connected to the outcomes? Are the inquiry processes geared towards explicating those outcomes? And will the, ass the assessment measure the level of performance? Is assessment ongoing rather than episodic? Is it once in a while? Is it once in a blue moon? Or is it part of an ongoing process? And we go here to the notion of scaffolding. You know, when we look at scaffolding, it's a really, really rich opportunity on which to build our assessment tasks. And, and it, you know, constructive alignment fits on beautifully on top of scaffolding. You identify your base tasks, and then you build the next one on top of that. And as you're designing a unit, or as your assessment's going through, the assessment can get deeper and focus more on higher order learning um, if it's ongoing. If it's episodic, all you're getting is a snapshot in time. Question number 10. Will learner feedback and reflection lead to improved performance? And that's a really valid question, isn't it? What you're feeding back, is it really actually going to lead to improved performance? Now, do you write back A, very well, nice picture, um, you know, 7 out of 10? Or B, do you provide a rubric with the levels of performance 
ticked on that rubric or circled or highlighted and then comments down the bottom about things the student could do to move up that level of performance on their next task. So these are all you know, really, really important questions to ask yourself when you're looking at a unit of physical science. What recommendations could I use? Why? What would I make? What would I say? And why would I say it? There's 10 questions, 10 spaces you can look in. And the last word is Vygotsky. And the underlying intention of formative assessment is to use what Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development. And um, so I've got 1962 besides Vygotsky there. It's actually 1978 his, his seminal piece came out. Of course, he wrote in the 1920s, um, but it was actually uh, uh, 1978 when he published. But the zone of proximal development is to, to facilitate the, the learning and the teaching process. And that's where formative assessment lives. That's where it breathes. It's the trench in which Vygotsky um, drops his zone of proximal development and the five E's models clearly has it in stages two and three. Really important when you're looking and look for it there. Look how it's embedded and use the 10 questions on the previous slide. Does it, does it meet those assessment requirements? Does it meet the, the conditions of effective assessment? Now the ZPD draws attention to what the learner can achieve without help and what the learner can achieve with appropriate help and that's why it's, it's so critical. It's supported by, you know, as I said on the previous uh, slide, the concept of scaffolding from, from Wood right back in 1976. Um, if we can scaffold and, and, and you know, build our learning schema in layers, lay them down like foundations, the ZPD provides the, the mortar by which we join them together. It's the theoretical foundations that teach us to build their approach to student learning. And this can be done using scaffolding. We break the tasks down, we lay down the foundations, the ZPD is the spot where we work. It's the mortar where we bring those foundations and hold them together. Some interesting research that came out of Black and William and then the OECD in 2005. Achievement gains associated with formative assessment in the classroom have been characterised as among the largest ever reported for educational interventions. So we have a real need to align formative and summative work in new overall systems so that the teacher's formative work would not be undermined by summative pressures and indeed so that summative requirements might be better served by taking full advantage of improvements in teachers' assessment work. Black and William go on to say that the perception is uh, assessment is something that's done to disrupt learning. Form summative assessment can disrupt formative learning. Teachers then have to stop their teaching cycle. They have to put on a red light. They have to produce a task. They then have to mark that task and feed that task back. And the learning seems to, s to go on the back burner. Black and Williams say, we've got to change this. We've got to bring the learning forward into the, the, the milieu, into the social dynamic of the classroom, and we've got to embed it there and work with it there. And he says, both summative and formative assessment will be enriched by this, instead of being seen as somehow an uncomfortable tension in the work a teacher does. Moving on to our last slide. A joke. The Milky Way is seen from Mars. Um, it looks pretty good feel like one right now myself. I will speak to you again on Wednesday on the uh, Zoom Interactive. Please um, have a close listen to this, this um, uh, content lecture. Any questions that it provokes, please post on the forum or make sure that you, uh, you bring them up on the Wednesday session. Thank you.